We are really lucky to have Aniruddha Majumdar, um, who's an assistant professor in the mechanical and an aerospace engineering department at Princeton University, and also a part-time visiting research scientist at the Google AI lab in Princeton. Um, he and his co-authors have written this wonderful paper, which is called Robots That Ask for Help, Conform Prediction for LLM Planners, um, which sort of, you know, majorly rocked the boat on Twitter um, and has all these awesome demos of robots that like perform intelligent behaviors using conformal prediction. Um, and so, you know, I really feel like this is the cutting edge stuff at like the intersection of conformal prediction and robotics. And I'm super excited to hear his talk. So um, let's just, you know, warmly invite him to give the talk. And also for those of you that are able to turn on your cameras, I would love that. Uh, it leads to a much more personal experience for our speaker. So I'll leave my camera on and um, then let's uh, enjoy the talk ahead. Thank you so much for coming. Awesome. Yeah, thanks so much for the the introduction and for the, the invitation to, uh, to present. Um, so my group at Princeton uh, kind of overall works on enabling agile robotic systems uh, such as drones, uh, legged robots, manipulators, uh, to operate with formal assurances on, on safety and performance in complex environments. Uh, and over the past few years, we've been thinking about how to make formal assurances in the form of statistical guarantees uh, for robots that have machine learning uh, components in them. So uh, we're seeing kind of an increasing adoption of uh, deep learning components and their perception, planning, prediction pipelines uh, of many different robotic systems, in, including some safety critical ones. Uh, so it's important to think about how we can provide some kind of meaningful formal assurances uh, on these kinds of uh, systems. And I think that the main technical challenge from my perspective uh, has to do with uh, generalization. Uh, so how can we provide uh, guarantees on the safety or performance of our robotic system uh, when we deploy it uh, beyond the finite amount of kind of training and data uh, that we use to, to train our different machine learning components? Uh, so we see this challenge of generalization kind of play out in the wild in, in many different uh, uh, settings. Uh, this is one of uh, Tesla's uh, vehicles that's driving down a, a highway at kind of evening time. Uh, and what's interesting is the perception, uh, the output of the perception system. So as you can see, uh, it kind of interprets the sun that's low down in the sky uh, as a yellow traffic light. And that actually uh, causes the, the car to, to try to brake. Uh, in this case, the human driver is paying attention, and if you look at the bottom of the video, they uh, override this braking command, uh, and, and there's no kind of harm. Uh, but if this was fully autonomous, then this could potentially lead to an unsafe outcome. So I see this as a failure of generalization. This perception system uh, was trained using gigantic amounts of data, lots of different scenarios, uh, but it's not generalizing to this particular novel uh, instance. And I think we see this challenge of generalization play out not just with autonomous vehicles, but with many other uh, robotic systems as well. So if you want to deploy a robot in a home or an office in any kind of human-centered environment, uh, these systems must also be able to, uh, to generalize to, to novel uh, scenarios. Uh, so in today's talk, I'll focus on generalization in the context of language-instructed uh, robots. Uh, and specifically, as Anastasia just mentioned, uh, I'll uh, talk about this paper uh, that we have with uh, collaborators from uh, Google DeepMind, so robots that uh, ask for help. Um, so the past uh, year or two, there's been a lot of excitement uh, in using large language models, uh, LLMs, for uh, robot planning. Uh, so there have been a number of papers that demonstrate how we can use LLMs to generate long horizon plans for robots. Uh, by leveraging some prior knowledge uh, and rich context uh, that's embedded in these LLMs. Uh, they can perform some kind of uh, abstract reasoning uh, and also generate code uh, that can be directly executed on robots as, uh, as policies. Uh, and again, I think the, the main challenge from my perspective uh, in this area has to do with generalization. Uh, how can we ensure the reliability of these language instructed robots uh, when we deploy them in diverse environments to perform diverse tasks uh, with uh, diverse uh, and potentially ambiguous uh, natural language uh, instructions. Uh, and I think in, in the context of uh, language instructed robots in particular, there are two key challenges that I want to highlight. Uh, the first is the kind of well-documented uh, tendency of LLMs to hallucinate, uh, so to generate outputs uh, that are not necessarily correct or uh, kind of are untethered from reality. 
Uh, and the second is the inherent kind of the high degree of ambiguity uh, that exists uh, when we're thinking about language instructions uh, for robots. So as an example, uh, let's say we ask a robot, hey robot, place the, the bowl in the microwave, please. Uh, in this case, there are two bowls in the, in, in, on the counter in front of the, the robot. So there's a metal bowl and a plastic bowl. Uh, so if you just ask a LLM to, to generate some plan, uh, it might pick one or the other. Maybe it'll pick the, the metal bowl, uh, place that in the microwave, uh, which could potentially lead to uh, a bad outcome, such as a, a fire, for instance. Um, so in this work, what we were uh, kind of aiming to do was endow our robotic systems uh, with the ability to, to know when they don't know uh, and to ask for help instead of just kind of blindly following some plan uh, that's generated by a large uh, language model. Uh, so in this case, uh, in this example, uh, placing the bowl in the microwave, uh, instead of just executing some plan that comes from an LLM, uh, we would ideally want our robot to ask, hey, which bowl did you mean, the, the plastic bowl or the, the metal bowl? Uh, and to seek these kinds of uh, clarifications from the, the human. Uh, so prior work uh, in the context of uh, language instructed uh, robots, uh, so using LLMs for, for robot planning, uh, either doesn't seek these kinds of clarifications explicitly uh, or does so via extensive prompting, uh, which makes it pretty hard to ensure that uh, even if you do seek help, that that results in some desired level of task success uh, that is uh, specified by the, the user. Uh, so in this work, we tried to kind of formalize our goal uh, using something that we call uh, uncertainty alignment. So trying to uh, kind of align the uh, understanding of uncertainty uh, that the robot has uh, with the things that a, a human uh, cares about. Uh, and we formalized this using kind of two criteria. Uh, the first one is calibrated confidence. Uh, so a user should be able to specify some level, desired level of success, uh, and the robot should be able to ensure that uh, kind of statistically guaranteed level of success by seeking a sufficient amount of help or clarifications from the human. Uh, and the second criterion is what we call minimal help. So the robot should try to minimize the overall amount of help uh, that it uh, seeks. Uh, so if it's helpful, you can think of this as a constrained optimization problem. Uh, so the robot is trying to uh, minimize uh, the number of interventions or the amount of help uh, that it seeks uh, from, from the human uh, while ensuring this kind of uh, statistically guaranteed uh, level of uh, task success. Um, so the approach that, that we've taken in this work, uh, so we call it no-no, so short for know when you don't know. Uh, it has two key ingredients that I'll, I'll describe. Uh, the first one is to pose the problem of planning in these kinds of robotics contexts uh, as a, a problem of multiple choice uh, question answering, so MCQA for, for short. Uh, and the second kind of key ingredient is to use conformal prediction uh, for uncertainty quantification. Uh, so before kind of describing this in a, in a bit more uh, detail, uh, let me introduce some notation and make the, the problem uh, a bit more formal. Uh, so we're going to consider kind of episodic tasks where at every uh, episode, uh, the robot is placed in some environment that I'll call E. Um, so you can think of E as a partially observable Markov decision process, a PUMDP, that's initialized at some particular state uh, that the robot kind of uh, can only indirectly observe through its sensor observations. Um, so uh, the robot has also provided some natural language instruction that I'll call L uh, corresponding to some goal G. Uh, so the goal is not kind of directly observed by the, uh, the robot. Uh, you can think of the goal as a subset of acceptable states in the, the PalmDP. Uh, the robot just indirectly observes the, the goal uh, through the, the natural language uh, instruction. Uh, I'll define uh, a, a scenario, which you can think of as a tuple of environment uh, language instruction and uh, and goal. Uh, and the main assumption that we're going to make in this work uh, is that there's some true but unknown distribution D uh, over scenarios, so over these like tuples of environment language instruction and, uh, and goal. Uh, and finally, we'll assume that we have access to some uh, training scenarios, uh, so scenarios that are drawn uh, IID from this unknown uh, distribution over scenarios that the robot might uh, encounter. Okay, so I guess with that uh, setup, let me describe how the uh, the planning and the the interaction between the uh, the human and the robot happens. 
Um, so initially, the the robot is given some natural language instructions. So for example, place the, the bowl in the microwave, please. Um, the robot has also provided some context about the environment. So for instance, uh, telling the robot that there's a microwave, a landfill bin, a recycling bin, bin and a compost bin in the environment. Uh, and then the, the robot uses its sensors, so cameras, LiDAR, whatever other sensors it has, uh, to generate a text description of the environment. So you can think of this as a vision language model that takes uh, as input the observations uh, that the robot gets uh, and basically gives a, a text output. So in this case, I see a metal bowl and a plastic bowl on the counter. Uh, the robot then generates uh, some possible next steps, some plans uh, uh, for the, the robot to execute uh, using a, a large language model, given the instruction and the environment context and the sensor uh, observations. Uh, so this kind of concatenation of instruction, environment description, uh, and generated plans, uh, I'm going to call that the context, and we'll refer to that at xt. So this is the context uh, at time set t. Um, so now this becomes a, a kind of a MCQA problem. We have these four options that are generated by uh, the LLM. We append an option E, which is just none of the above. Uh, and then we ask the language model to, to score these different options using its kind of softmax uh, scores. Um, we then use a conformal prediction to generate a prediction set. So this is a, a subset uh, of the options, uh, A, B, C, D, E. Uh, that are generated kind of based on the heuristic confidences uh, that come from the, the large language model. So I'll describe the, the CP pipeline uh, in a bit more detail uh, in a few minutes. Uh, and then uh, if this prediction set uh, has size one, so if it is a singleton, uh, then the robot simply executes that plan. Uh, if the prediction set has size larger than one, uh, then that triggers help. Uh, so either the robot presents these options uh, kind of directly to the human and the human selects one of the options uh, or we use a, a language model to generate kind of just a natural language question uh, based on these different options in the prediction set. I have a quick question here, if you don't Yes, mind. absolutely. So what happens if the prediction set has size zero? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So the prediction set has size zero, we would just uh, halt the operation. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, we would just, uh, yeah, just, just the human would like stop the, the robot from, from operating. And do you call, and do you call that accuracy like, what, how do you factor that into your accuracy? Yeah, so it should be uh, inaccurate, right? Um, so I guess this could happen in, in regular conformal prediction as well. Uh, so I think it would be counted as, uh, as a miscoverage. As yeah. yeah, as a miscoverage, yep. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, and also, I guess I should have mentioned, feel free to, to stop me with uh, questions at any time. I'm happy to, to take them. Okay, so yeah, I guess this is the clarification question uh, that's generated in this case. Uh, which one do you mean, uh, plastic or, or metal? Uh, the human provides a clarification, so the, the plastic bowl. Uh, and then we assume that there is some low-level language uh, conditioned uh, policy uh, that, that is responsible for kind of taking that plan and like actually kind of executing it uh, in the uh, level of uh, motor torques. Uh, so the robot takes some action, uh, AT, uh, the action at time step T, uh, that results in the POMDP transitioning to the next state, ST plus one. Uh, and then we can repeat this whole loop uh, until the episode ends, either in, in success or in uh, or in failure. So that's kind of the, the high level overview of the, the architecture. Uh, so next I'll, I'll dig into uh, some of the, the details uh, on uh, this kind of uh, planning as MCQA and uncertainty quantification using conformal prediction. Um, so this MCQA problem uh, is like it comes from the instruction, the observations from the robot sensors, uh, and then the possible uh, next steps that's generated by a large language model. Uh, and basically, the large language model then needs to select one of these options, uh, A, B, C, D, E. Um, so the main thing that this does is it reduces the problem of next step prediction in planning uh, to the problem of next token prediction. Uh, which kind of aligns pretty nicely with the training data uh, that these large language models are often trained on, which has a lot of kind of MCQA data in them, uh, and also the loss functions, uh, which are uh, about next token uh, prediction. Uh, so the model uh, then like scores these uh, different options, uh, A, B, C, D, E, uh, with the, the log likelihood, so the, the softmax scores. Um, 
And one kind of additional advantage of, of this uh, is that it eliminates some of the length uh, biases that we see uh, that are associated with scoring entire sentences. So an alternative to this would be uh, instead of scoring like A, B, C, D, E, uh, you generate these different outputs as uh, sentences, uh, and then you score them using, for example, the, the perplexity of the sentences. Uh, but it turns out that that doesn't work so well because there's a, a bias against very long outputs. Uh, so reducing everything to just one token prediction, single token prediction, uh, eliminates some of the, these kind of uh, length biases that we see uh, with the current models. Uh, the next uh, kind of key idea, the, the other key idea, uh, as I mentioned, is to use uh, conformal prediction for uncertainty quantification. Uh, so I guess to this audience, I don't need to kind of sell uh, CP, uh, but I'll just kind of uh, briefly mention some of the advantages that I see from a robotics perspective. Uh, so the first one is, is uh, the ability to provide some nice statistical guarantees uh, on coverage, uh, which we can then kind of translate into uh, guarantees on task completion, as I'll, I'll mention in a couple of slides. Uh, it doesn't assume any knowledge of the kind of distribution of our scenarios that the robot might encounter. So this distribution could be pretty complicated and might be hard to kind of explicitly characterize. Um, it's pretty lightweight, uh, computationally lightweight, easy to use approach that kind of sits as a wrapper around uh, foundation models, like large language models for, for planning. Uh, and it kind of improves with the growing uh, capabilities of uh, large language models, uh, which is a nice uh, feature to, to have. Uh, and yeah, there's been kind of an increasing use uh, of conformal prediction in robotics context. So doing things like uh, failure prediction, anomaly detection, uh, trajectory prediction, and, and so on. So I think we're uh, kind of seeing these, these tools being applied in a powerful way in a robotics context. Okay, so let me dig into the conformal prediction pipeline in a, in a bit more detailed, detail. Um, so we were assuming that there's some kind of underlying large language model that has uh, the ability to generate like heuristic uh, scores using some function that I'll call f hat. So you can think of these as just like the, the softmax scores uh, assigned to the labels, uh, in our case, A, B, C, D, E. Uh, we're also assuming some calibration data set. Uh, so I'll first describe everything in the single time step setting. So whether robot just plans um, uh, for, uh, in, a, in a single time step, and then I'll extend everything to the, the multi-step setting. So in the single time step setting, uh, we have some context. So again, context is instruction, environment description, plans. Uh, so those are the Xs. Uh, and then we also have uh, Ys, which are the, the true label, so the kind of correct plan uh, for each of the, the different contexts in our calibration data set. So we're assuming these pairs of contexts and, and correct plans. Uh, assumed to have been drawn from some unknown uh, distribution D. Uh, conformal prediction then uh, for any new test uh, inputs, any new test uh, context, uh, outputs some prediction set uh, that has a statistical guarantee on coverage uh, with some user specified confidence one minus epsilon. Uh, so in our case, again, the uh, labels are A, B, C, D, E corresponding to the different plans that are initially generated by the LLM. We scored these plans using language model and then CP uses those scores to generate a, a subset of, uh, of plans. Uh, so let me talk, uh, as I mentioned, about the single step, uh, single time step setting first. Uh, so this is where the robot plans just once. So in that planning step, it could potentially plan for a number of future time step, time steps, uh, but the planning only happens once. So I guess that's what I mean by single uh, step uh, setting. Uh, so in this setting, we collect some data set S uh, of contexts and, and true labels, uh, again, drawn from these scenarios that are that are drawn from some unknown distribution D. Um, for now, I'm going to assume that uh, every context has one kind of unique label Y, so one true correct thing that the robot should have done. I'll relax that assumption in, in a couple of slides. Uh, we then perform the kind of usual conformal prediction calibration. So we define uh, non-conformity scores uh, for each example. So that's one minus um, the softmax scores that's assigned to the, the true label for, for each of the uh, examples in the calibration data set. Uh, and then we define Q hat to be this uh, kind of approximately one minus epsilon empirical quantile of the, the non-conformity scores. Uh, then at test time, uh, we're given some new instruction. 
uh, the robot uses the sensors to get a description of the environment uh, and then uses the language model to generate some plans. So that's the context. Uh, and then given this new context, x test, at test time, uh, we create a prediction set uh, by including all the labels uh, among A, B, C, D, E uh, that are above uh, 1 minus Q hat, where Q hat was the threshold uh, that we computed using uh, the, this kind of conformal prediction calibration step. Um, so if this prediction set is a singleton, uh, then the robot executes that plan. Uh, if it's not a singleton, then the robot presents the options in the plan to a, a human, uh, and the human chooses um, one of the uh, the options uh, if the kind of correct option is is in the prediction set, uh, or uh, otherwise it just halts uh, halts the operation for the the robot. So, sorry, was there a question? Okay, never mind. Um, so yeah, I guess with, with this setup, uh, conformal prediction uh, provides a, a coverage guarantee. So uh, with probability at least one minus epsilon, uh, the um, true label, uh, so the kind of correct plan uh, is guaranteed to be in the prediction set uh, that's generated using the scheme. Uh, and another kind of nice property to, to have uh, is that uh, CP kind of approximately minimizes the average prediction set sizes uh, uh, kind of under the assumption that uh, F hat accurately models uh, the true conditional uh, probabilities. Uh, in practice, as I was talking to Anna Socios about this uh, beforehand, uh, we're particularly interested in the data set uh, conditional uh, coverage uh, guarantees, which say, so these are kind of the pack style guarantees, so with probability one minus delta, or the sampling of the calibration data set, uh, we get the coverage guarantee for future test inputs. Uh, and the reason is that in, in these kinds of uh, settings, we only have one calibration data set that we kind of painstakingly collect. Uh, and then we want to use the results from that one data set for multiple uh, predictions, multiple uh, test inputs. Uh, and in that case, uh, I think the, the data set conditional guarantee is much more meaningful than, than a marginal uh, guarantee, the, the usual kind of marginal guarantee. Um, so I guess with, with those uh, properties uh, of conformal prediction, they kind of translate directly uh, into the, the two criteria that I had laid out in formalizing this problem of uncertainty alignment. Uh, so providing statistical guarantees on task completion while minimizing help. So the coverage guarantee from conformal prediction uh, kind of directly translates uh, to uh, a task success guarantee uh, because with probability one minus epsilon, uh, the uh, correct plan is guaranteed to be included in the prediction set. Uh, and assuming the human kind of selects the correct plan accurately, uh, then that results uh, in a, a guarantee on, on task success. Uh, and because conformal prediction kind of approximately minimizes the, the number of options that are presented to the human, that addresses the, uh, the criterion of uh, trying to minimize help. So maybe let me pause here for a minute, uh, see if there are any questions either on the uh, problem formulation or the, the approach uh, that we're using. Sorry, this is probably just very basic question, but how can the model both, like how does it work to generate both the choices and the scores? Yeah. Like, is it like a one step thing or like it seemed like then you prompt it again to like which yes. one is the one? So, yeah. Yeah, good. So, it's actually a, a two step uh, process. So, we initially prompted uh, to generate the, uh, the plans. Uh, so, that happens uh, with the language instruction, the original instruction, the environment description that comes from the sensor. And then, then we say, uh, like, generate some plans. Uh, and then we also, uh, I guess th there's a little bit of kind of prompt engineering here, which goes into like trying to make sure that the plans that the LLM generates are like pretty diverse. Uh, mm -hmm. Otherwise, what can happen is that it basically just generates the same plan over and over again, which is not super useful. So uh, right. we do a little bit of kind of fuchsia prompting to make sure that it generates some uh, diverse set of plans that like cover the possible like correct uh, kind of answers. Uh, and then once we do that, uh, we concatenate the original instruction, the, con the um, environment description, and the, the plans. Uh, and then we prompt it again. We say, like, which of these options is correct? Yes. Which of these options yes. should the robot execute next? Uh, and, and that. 
Sorry, go ahead. I don't know. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that second step is when the, the confidences are generated for, for the options A, B, C, D. Yep. And and to generate the training prompts, like the yes. training options, like are all like kind of plausible things or like one, it's like open the window and like throw the ball outside the window. <laughs> uh, so I guess you mean <laughs> for the for the prompts or do you mean? Yeah, for like the the the, the choice generation part yeah like is there like a fine-tuning step of the llm on that side of things too and like if those are human generated like was there a particular strategy that you guys used to construct these possible choices got it yeah so i, I think there are two things going on here so one is uh, when we generate the calibration data set uh, so there we're still asking the llm to to generate plans uh, and then the human selects uh, the kind of correct plan uh, among those options that are generated by the LLM. So that's the those are the kind of X Y like pairs in the calibration data set. Uh, there's a sec. There's another thing which is uh, the kind of prompt that's given to the LLM to generate the, the plans in the first place. Uh, that is more kind of human like intuition driven. Like we're I see, I see. assuming that we have some idea of what the task is going to be, so we provide some uh -huh. examples. Uh, like a few examples uh, of um, like instructions, environment descriptions, uh, plans. So we, we yeah, we, we give a few of those, yeah. I see, uh, I see. But yeah, I guess there's some kind of um, like intuition that, that goes into that. There's no like fully automated way of- mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Cool, thank you so much. Good. One more question along the same lines there. Um, is So is it, does it ever happen that like the true answer is never included in the set of options? Um, in the first step, like, yeah, the way we get around that is by always appending an additional option, uh, which is like none of the above. Yeah. Uh, so there's always going to be one correct option. It could be none of the above, but but there's always going to be kind of one correct option within the the set of possibilities that's laid out. Beautiful. Thank you. Good. Good. Other questions. Okay, sounds good. So yeah, let's talk about some extensions. So I, I mentioned that we're assuming uh, that there's one kind of true label, one correct plan uh, for every context, but that's obviously not necessarily the case. Uh, so in, in a lot of settings, there might be multiple acceptable plans that are generated by the uh, the large language model. Uh, so this is something that's been considered like previously in the uh, conformal prediction literature. Uh, and we're kind of using the, the same uh, trick here. So the trick is to basically reduce the setting with multiple acceptable labels uh, to the one where you have a unique correct label uh, by just kind of artificially defining a unique label um, as the label Y uh, kind of among the uh, the acceptable options uh, that has the highest score uh, assigned to it by the, uh, the large language model. So we just call that the true label and then we proceed uh, kind of as usual with the uh, conformal prediction calibration steps and, and so on. Uh, so essentially what this does is it uh, ensures that the prediction set uh, contains at least one acceptable label uh, with probability one minus epsilon, uh, which is what we want. So we just want the prediction set to just have one correct uh, or one kind of uh, uh, acceptable uh, plan uh, to, to present to the, the human. The more technically kind of interesting and, and challenging extension uh, is to the multi time step setting. Uh, where the robot uh, does planning in multiple time steps. Um, so we actually kind of uh, came up with a, an extension of, uh, of control operation to this multi-step uh, setting. Uh, and the main challenge has to do with distribution shift or potential distribution shift, uh, because the actions that the robot takes uh, influence future observations, future contexts. Uh, and yeah, that, that can lead to a, a distribution shift if we're not careful. Um, so the key ideas are, I'll, I'll present it at a high level, the, the details are, are in the paper, um, but the key idea is to basically lift all the data uh, to episode level sequences uh, and perform uh, calibration at the sequence level with a carefully chosen score function uh, that allows us to um, do a causal reconstruction of the prediction set at test time. So basically at calibration time, we work over sequences, we do the calibration over sequences, 
but then at test time, the robot kind of doesn't get to see the whole sequence of contacts beforehand. Uh, it operates time step to time step. Uh, so we kind of causally reconstruct the prediction set uh, at test time in a, in a specific way that I'll, I'll describe in a, in a minute. Um, and the kind of result of this is that it, uh, this procedure provides episode level uh, calibrated confidence and minimal help. Um, and and that, that those are kind of nice uh, properties to, to have. So let me yeah, describe this multi-step extension in a, in a bit more detail. Uh, so as I mentioned, the main idea is to lift everything to, to sequences. Um, so we're going to assume that each data point uh, consists of a sequence of contexts. So one context for every time step, zero through the time horizon, uh, capital T minus one. Uh, and for each of these, we have a, a label, uh, so the kind of correct uh, plan uh, that the, the robot should execute among the options that were generated based on their context at those time steps. Uh, and here, the, the kind of key uh, property is that uh, each xt, so each context at time t, uh, arises from having uh, performed the correct actions at the previous steps. So that's how these uh, sequences are, are defined. Uh, we then assume that we have access to some calibration data set uh, of sequences of contexts and correct labels again, generated in this way where the robot takes the correct action uh, at every uh, time step. That's how the future uh, contexts uh, are, are generated. Uh, and then I guess this is kind of the, the key bit. So we define a specific score function uh, for sequences, um, which is the minimum over time uh, of the uh, 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 confidence, the softmax score uh, that's, that's assigned to the, the labels. Uh, and basically, this kind of definition of the score function is what's going to allow us to causally reconstruct the prediction set uh, at test time. Uh, but at calibration time, uh, once we have these kind of calibration uh, data points, uh, we perform calibration with sequences uh, using this uh, score function that's defined at the, the sequence level. So this allows us to define uh, a sequence level uh, prediction set, uh, which includes all uh, labels, uh, or sequences of labels, uh, which are assigned a score uh, that's higher than the threshold, uh, one minus Q hat, uh, that's computed using uh, the uh, control prediction calibration step. The main, I guess, issue. So that, yes. Um, just so that I have some intuition for this, this is basically saying we're going to get, we're going to take the worst case confidence. Exactly. We could like look at over the entire sequence and make the biggest prediction set that we could ever see. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, and it's worst case over time for each for each episode. Yeah. There's one more question, I think. Yeah, thanks. I was also wondering. So, if you end up with none of the above, then how do you like? How do you respond to that? Like, if you're assuming that you always make the take the correct action, then how do you yeah. ensure the correction act, action when it's none of the above? Yeah. yeah, good question. So, if it's none of the above, uh, we assume that the human like has to tell the robot what the, the correct action is. So that one is the, the kind of annoying uh, case. Um, we, in practice, we are, we observe that it's typically not none of the above uh, for, for like the, uh, the examples that we've considered, but, uh, but yeah, that, that, that's kind of the tricky case where uh, the human has to like tell the robot what to do or like the human has to, to take the action. So that, that's another like underlying assumption. Yeah. Does that uh, address your question? I think so, yeah. Maybe I'll follow up later. Thanks. OK. OK, so yeah, so I mentioned how we can generate this like sequence level uh, prediction set. Um, but the issue is that this prediction set is uh, constructed with the full sequence of contexts uh, at test time. Uh, but we don't see, the robot doesn't see the entire sequence of contexts ahead of time. It just sees it kind of one by one as it takes actions in the environment. Um, so what we do is we causally reconstruct the prediction set. By causally, I mean that uh, the robot relies on observations that it's seen uh, up to time t uh, to generate a prediction set. Uh, so we define ct uh, to be all the labels at time step t, uh, such that the uh, confidence is higher than the same threshold that we uh, calculated, so 1 minus uh, q hat. Uh, and then we define uh, c. Uh, the prediction set for the entire episode uh, as just the Cartesian product uh, of each of these individual prediction sets uh, for each uh, for each time step. Um, so I want to kind of prove this here, but uh, 
This procedure uh, causally reconstructs the sequence level prediction set um, uh, C bar, uh, which we uh, defined on the, the previous slide. Uh, and the reason it does so is because of the specific score function that we use, which is kind of this worst case uh, over over time. So that that choice of score function uh, is what allows us to predict the is what allows to, allows us to construct the prediction sets uh, kind of one at a time and recover the the sequence level uh, prediction set. Um, so yeah, I guess the, the upshot of this is that uh, we get a, a statistical guarantee on coverage at the sequence level. Uh, so what that means is that with probability one minus epsilon, uh, the all the the labels that are um, sorry, all the prediction sets that are generated uh, contain the true labels for the the corresponding times. Um, so if you think about the uh, sequence uh, of prediction sets, uh, that is guaranteed to contain the correct sequence of uh, actions, the correct sequence of labels. Um, uh, with probability uh, one minus epsilon, uh, and that kind of uh, translates into a sequence level uh, task completion, which is uh, what we uh, what we care about. Okay, let me maybe pause again uh, for a minute before I move on to experiments and and results. See if there are any uh, questions on this. Yeah, I was just wondering. So do you do you do you do all this procedure also for the calibration set then too? You do it exactly the same for both. The calibrations data and for the test data. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So with the the calibration data um, data set, we uh, yeah, it's the same the same kind of procedure. Like for every time step, uh, we ask the LM to generate options. We score them. Uh, sorry, we don't, uh, yeah, I guess we, we score them, and uh, the human selects the the true plan, the correct plan, uh, and then the environment like steps and and so on. Um, and yeah, the, the score function, uh, again, that we use is like the minimum over time of the confidences uh, over the, the episode. Good. Other questions? I, I have a quick question. Um, so on the extension to uh, potentially multiple correct answers per step, yeah. um, you're, you're saying that, okay, I'm just going to assume that the correct one is the one with the largest score. Yeah. And and it's and it's true that that gives you the guarantee that you need, but the guarantee in this case is pessimistic, right? Um, so do you, do you have? I mean, it's pessimistic in the sense that you are kind of assuming that all of the others are incorrect, and and that may not be true. There might still be one that is correct. So do you have any ideas on or like are you guys working on trying to extend these guarantees to the cases when you have multiple correct um, answers and 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 you you know you, you treat them as correct as opposed to just uh, reduce it yeah. to one yeah that's a good question i i don't have good ideas on on how to do that uh, i think this trick of just saying that the true label is the the one uh for which the llm assigns the, the highest score um i think fits neatly with the conformal prediction calibration procedure um because like the way the prediction set is kind of computed is like you rank all the, the options uh, according to the confidence, and then you uh, include like all of them that are above uh, uh, Q hat uh, or one minus Q hat. Um, and yeah, so if you like basically kind of define the true label as the one that's assigned the highest confidence, then the like that encourages the prediction sets to be small while still ensuring that at least one uh, kind of correct option is is in the prediction set. Yeah, I don't have a good idea, unfortunately, for uh, for yeah, like the, the kind of broader uh, way of uh, of doing it. I haven't seen uh, that in the literature. I, I know, I guess there has been work on multiple acceptable options, but yeah, the the trick kind of uh, that I've seen used is also the the same one we used here. But yeah, I'm open to suggestions. I guess if someone knows how to do it better, I would be very interested. What was the exact question again? Um, do you mind repeating? Yeah. So, so if if um if, if maybe if you can go back to that slide, that that'd be helpful. Yeah. So basically, you're in a setting where there are multiple uh, correct answers that are possible, and you you know one one way of uh, making sure that you can use all of this uh, framework is to just restrict yourself to just picking a single one and assuming that you're just going to pick the best one and assume that that's the correct one, but there might be others there that maybe receive the second score or the third score or whatever that it's still correct, but you're disregarding. And so 
I guess in that sense, the guarantee is is pessimistic because you're missing the chance of of correctly reporting a correct one. Is is is, is that accurate, um, Anuruga? Yeah, I think I think it's accurate. Um... I I actually don't think it. Uh, I don't think it's pessimistic. So one way that you can okay. do this is by running conformal risk control, and like uh, assigning a loss of one to everything that's not like. Um, not within the acceptable set and assigning a loss to, of, of zero to everything that's within the acceptable set of answers. But I think the sets are going to be equivalent to the ones that are output by this procedure that he's defining here, just because like, as you get a loss of zero, anytime like the arc, like beta, this beta thing is included in the set. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it would be conservative if, if somehow you had a nested set of prediction sets that weren't ordered from greatest to least probability but not for this particular set construction. Yeah, I think without extra information beyond the confidences that are generated, like it seems hard to, to do it in a different way. Um, yeah, like I guess because like the options are being ranked by confidence and we're just trying to say like, just include the, the one where you have the highest confidence. Uh, yeah, it seems hard to do it without some, some additional information. Yeah. Thank you both. Cool. Yep. Sounds good. So yeah, let me describe. Uh, so I think we have about 15 minutes or so. Let me describe uh, some experiments that we've done to, to evaluate this framework, uh, both in simulation and also uh, on hardware with uh, different uh, manipulation tasks. Uh, so we've implemented this. I'll, I'll give you just a qualitative overview first, and then we'll dig into some of the numbers. We've implemented this on a mobile manipulation setup, uh, by manual manipulation, and also uh, tabletop uh, rearrangement. So the first one. Hey, is... robots! Could you put the bowl on a small counter in a microwave? Yes, yeah, this uh, mobile uh, manipulation setup. Uh, so this is the example I was using as a running example. The bowl or the plastic bowl. Pick up the plastic bowl, please. Yeah, so it's kind of the, the same pipeline that I uh, described before. And so it's generating plans, scoring them, coming up with a prediction set. The human provides clarification and the, the robot kind of does the, the action. Um, in some instances, some scenarios, there's no ambiguity. So here the instruction is to provide, uh, to put the kettle chips in the landfill. There's only one instance of the kettle chips or what just kind of uh, generates a prediction set that's a singleton uh, and goes and executes that uh, that plan. In the bimanual setup, uh, we had some ambiguities uh, having to do with which arm should be used uh, for a certain task and also which bin uh, objects should be placed in. And again, we were using the, the same kind of exact same pipeline. Uh, and then finally, in this tabletop rearrangement setup, we were simulating a human that has preferences for healthier foods, but these preferences are not kind of explicitly uh, fully revealed to the large language model planner. Uh, so they're kind of only partially revealed, and the planner needs to infer uh, which food items the human is going to like versus not like and sort them into the, the different uh, plates. And if it's not confident uh, about uh, whether a human is going to like the, the human is going to like the the food item or not, then it asks for uh, for clarification. Okay, so that's kind of the, the qualitative picture. So let me describe uh, some more quantitative results. So we performed uh, a number of comparisons with the different baseline approaches. Uh, and all, all of the experiments here are with the, the Palm uh, 2L uh, language model from, from Google. Uh, so we compared the CP-based approach uh, with something that we call simple set. Uh, so that's just ranking the options uh, with the heuristic score f hat from the large language model uh, and constructing a prediction set uh, by just including all the options such that the cumulative score uh, is, uh, is at least one minus uh, epsilon. Uh, ensemble set uh, where options are ranked according to the empirical frequency with which they appear if you randomize the prompt. So I guess these, these are kind of uh, ensemble based methods. Uh, and then we also, um, explored uh, kind of prompt-based methods where we just asked the LLM to directly output a prediction set just via prompting. 
uh, and then a, a binary set baseline where the LLM outputs a binary indicator uh, of whether or not it is uh, certain. Uh, and then finally, no help, where the LLM just uh, kind of uh, uh, takes the, the action uh, with the, the highest uh, score, so never asks for clarification. Uh, so in simulation, we considered a, a tabletop rearrangement setup where uh, there's a, a bunch of bowls and blocks of uh, different colors uh, on the table, and the task is to move a certain number of objects to a, a specified location. Uh, and there are ambiguities here uh, having to do with how objects are referred to, so like saying receptacle instead of bowl, uh, or numerical ambiguities, so, so saying move a few blocks but not specifying exactly how many. Uh, and then spatial ambiguities uh, say move this object next to another object, but not specifying kind of exactly uh, where you want to be moved. Uh, so the first uh, kind of observation here is that uh, with our approach, this control operation based approach, um, we get to the target success rate, the desired target success rate, pretty consistently. Uh, and that's not surprising because that's kind of what conformal prediction is giving us. So on the y axis here, I'm plotting the deviation. Uh, of the true kind of achieved task success rate from the desired uh, success rate one minus epsilon. Uh, and we see that over all of these different scenarios, the conformal prediction-based approach uh, kind of gives us the, uh, the desired task success rate pretty accurately, while the other baselines uh, uh, either overshoot or, or undershoot uh, by, uh, by some amounts. Uh, I guess the, the more kind of interesting uh, set of results is looking at the uh, trade-off between task success rate and the amount of help that the robot asks for. Uh, so on the x-axis here, I'm uh, uh, presenting the average prediction set size uh, that's presented to the human. Uh, the y-axis is the task success rate. Uh, and what we're doing to generate these curves is sweeping over epsilon. So that's the, the desired uh, uh, error rate. Um, and as you can see, uh, over a pretty kind of broad range of uh, task success rates, operation set sizes, uh, the CP-based approach uh, gives us a higher uh, success rate uh, with less help, uh, which is a, a nice, uh, nice property. Uh, you can do the kind of same kind of plot with uh, the x-axis being the human help rate. So you can think of this as the intervention rate. So the number of times or the proportion of times the robot uh, asks for uh, clarification. And again, we see a similar trend. So for a given uh, intervention rate, uh, the level of actually kind of uh, achieved task success is higher uh, for the CP-based approach than for the, the baselines. In the mobile manipulation setup, uh, we considered ambiguities in the form of uh, Winograd schemas. So these are sentences like, there's an apple and bottled water on the counter. It is rotten. Uh, can you dispose of it? So there's some ambiguity uh, about what the word it refers to. Uh, and uh, this ambiguating that uh, requires some kind of common sense reasoning. So you can think uh, that an apple can be rotten, but a bottled water cannot be rotten. So uh, the human must be referring to, uh, to the apple instead of the, the bottled water. But yeah, I guess there are kind of ambiguities here or potential ambiguities here. Uh, and we were also considering actions uh, or instructions uh, with potentially unsafe actions like placing a, a metal ball uh, into a, a microwave. Uh, and again, we see a, a similar trend here. So we're comparing uh, NONO, which is our uh, CP-based approach with simple set and, and no help. Um, here, one minus epsilon is set to 0.85, so 85% desired task success rate. Uh, and again, we see that the control operation achieves that uh, success rate uh, uh, there's some errors in the actual kind of low-level uh, execution, which we're not accounting for, but the planning success rate uh, is uh, 87%. Uh, and again, we see that the amount of help uh, that the, the human asks, sorry, the robot asks for uh, is less for conformal prediction uh, than it is for the simple set baseline. Uh, and we see that if you don't ask for any help, if the robot just kind of executes the plan from the LLM blindly, uh, then that uh, significantly reduces the, the success rates. Uh, and I guess one thing I should mention here is that for simple set, we chose the value of epsilon uh, to get the same level of uh, planning success rate uh, as we have for conformal prediction. So that makes the success rates equal, and then we can kind of uh, compare the, the help rates in a, in a fair way. Uh, and then we also uh, looked at different language models, so uh, instruction fine-tuned version of uh, Palm 2L, uh, and also GPT 3.5, which is an older uh, version now. 
Uh, and what's nice is that we see that with this kind of configuration based approach, uh, we always get the desired level of task success that we ask for. So in this case, 85%. Um, but CP basically adapt adaptively chooses the amount of help uh, uh, to, to ask for, uh, depending on the kind of quality of the language model. So with a good language model or a newer language model, the amount of help is less. Uh, with an older language model like GPT 3.5, um, you get the same task success rate, which is good. Um, but the robot kind of compensates by asking for more help or clarifications from the, the human. So, so I think that's a nice problem did, here. Did you, Sorry, set epsilon, did you set epsilon to be 0.15 or is it? 0.15, yeah, 0.15, yeah. Good, all right. So uh, let me end. I think we just have a few minutes. Um, so in this work, we introduced this uh, problem of uncertainty alignment uh, and formalized it using these two notions of calibrated confidence and, and minimal help. Uh, and we developed this control operation based pipeline, which acts as a, a pretty lightweight wrapper uh, around uh, existing large language model based uh, planners. Uh, and I'm pretty excited about this line of work. I, I see it as a step towards rigorous uncertainty quantification, uh, providing formal assurances on generalization uh, for language instructed robots. And hopefully there's going to be uh, much more work along these lines. There's certainly a lot of uh, open uh, questions that are uh, exciting to think about. Uh, so this work was led by my PhD student, uh, Alan Wren, uh, in collaboration with a couple of other students and postdocs from my group, and also a, a number of researchers uh, from uh, Google DeepMind. All right, so if you're interested, uh, our paper is on archive. We've also made some uh, code available, open source, uh, uh, Jupyter Notebooks, if you want to play around with some of these examples, uh, and then videos uh, kind of going into more details about the, the results. I'll leave you with this uh, conclusion slide. And yeah, if you have any questions, uh, additional questions, I'm, I'm happy to, to take them now. Thanks so much. Woo! <laughs> Good. Other questions? I know we, we took some already during the, the doc, but I'm happy to, to answer more. Uh, I have I have a couple questions. Yeah, thank yes. you so much for the talk. Um, this, yeah, really interesting. Um, I was or as a few specific questions about. I'm wondering like how much calibration data you use relative to your yeah. training data. Um, firstly, and then, um, yeah, I guess also for the uh, ensemble baseline, I'm wondering if you use like all of the data together, like if you use both the training and calibration data. Um, for the ensemble baseline to train on, or just the like training set from the conformal predictor. Okay, yeah. So um, I guess there's no, or so there is a distinction between training set and calibration set. Uh, but the training set is just whatever these large language models were trained on. So we don't do any additional fine tuning of the language models. We just take the existing like pre-trained. Uh, models so uh, palm 2l for for most of the, the results uh, and the calibration data set uh, so we use something on the order of like 500 or so i forget the exact number but roughly uh, 500 uh, calibration data points um, because we use the data set conditional version of the guarantee so that has like a delta parameter so with probability one minus delta over the calibration data set so we set delta to 0 0.01 so with 99 percent probability over the something of the yes. calibration data set, yeah. Um, yeah, I think roughly 500 or so like seems to give us kind of reasonable reasonable results and also allows us to curate the calibration data set in a reasonable amount of time. See, thanks. Also, and then, the ensemble. you had a question about the ensemble set. Yeah, ensemble set. Uh, so the ensembling happens over prompts, like over randomized prompts. Um, I don't think we do any fine tuning, if I remember correctly. Uh, so yeah, we just take the pre-trained model, we generate a bunch of prompts, and then we randomize over the prompts to get different predictions. And then we look at the frequencies, like the empirical frequencies, over the selected answers to, to generate the prediction sets. All right, thank you. Good, other questions?
All right. All right. Yeah. Well, if there's no other questions, then we should thank our speaker again for coming and you know sharing this wonderful material with us. So awesome. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Okay. Of course, I have plenty of questions, but maybe we okay. can close over email. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Yeah, yeah, and I'll visit Berkeley, like I said. So yeah, I'll. Uh, oh yeah. That's too. yeah. The best. But yeah, feel free to to send email. Beautiful. Awesome. Okay, everybody. Thanks right. for coming. See you later. Okay.